morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. My guest today is Jean Prochnow. Hey, Jean, how you doing? Excellent, Melinda. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm looking forward to speaking with you today. Well, I can't wait to hear all about you and your new book. Um, let me tell my viewers a little bit about you because you are a formidable human being. And um, so let me share with them who Eugene Proc now is. Uh, Gene was a former management consultant with one of the largest global consulting firms. He established a second career as a writer and a historian of the American Revolution. Since 2013, Gene has authored 20 scholarly articles for the prestigious peer-reviewed Journal of the American Revolution. For seven consecutive years running, at least one of Gene's essays has been selected for the print edition of the annual volume of the Journal of the American Revolution. Gene hosts and curates a website helping casual and professional researchers locate diaries and memoirs and other Revolutionary War sources. And that website is www.researchingtheamericanrevolution.com, all spelled out. Is that about right, Gene? Does that sort of cover? Well, thank you. That's a very gracious introduction, uh, Melinda. Well, I also want to add that you do live in Washington, D.C., with your wife and your two sons. So share with my viewers, Gene, a little bit about your life growing up and your childhood. Well, well, I, I was a, um, a son of a, a corporate vagabond. So my father um, it would, uh, traveled all over the country for his work, and he moved all over the country to the work. So I was born in the Midwest, uh, lived several places in the Midwest, and then moved to the South. Uh, at one time, I had a thick Southern accent, uh, <laughs> believe it or not. And then, um, then I moved up to the Northeast and lived in the New York City area. And um, from there, we uh, actually kind of fell in love with Vermont. So I never really lived in Vermont, but I spent a lot of time in Vermont uh, uh, on skiing, on vacations, and uh, just uh, roaming around the state. So kind of all over the place. So I, I don't really have a place I consider necessarily my home, but my home is with my family. And you, and, you, and you come to Vermont quite often. Uh, tell us a little bit about what inspired your, your love of history, and especially the Revolutionary War period. You know, it, it's, 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 I actually come from a pretty historical family. My, my two sons have history degrees, and um, so I'm, I feel like I'm kind of catching up to them. Um, and you learn from your children, and I, I certainly did. But uh, I, I, lived, um, uh, I lived for a time in Boston, and if you live in Boston, you can't hardly help but uh, know about history and, and get immersed in history. And that's where I first really got interested in the American Revolution. And um, I, I'm actually most interested in the uh, the battles are interesting, but the most interested in the kinds of the social aspects of the revolution and the people and what it was like to live there, because I think we often neglect that. And so that's really what got me interested in to um, delve behind the battles to find out what was it really like to live back then. And, and you went from a sort of a corporate job where you just sort of left that and dove into being a very notable historian. Um, what inspired you to become a writer and leave your, your day job? Well, a, a couple of things. One is, uh, as uh, my, my day job, as you mentioned, uh, I spent 38 years as a, um, a business advisor helping companies. Uh, I work for profit, nonprofit organizations, public organizations. I work for states, local hospitals, and um, the federal government. But well, I help them with business problems and um, organizational problems. And what I really like is analyzing kind of what's happened, why things happen. And that's really the core of a historian. You want to find out why things happen. And history always has some relevance. You want to make it, you know, it's, you don't write history just to recite the facts because everybody knows the facts. You write history to make it relevant to today. And that's kind of what a, a a, a business advisor, a consultant does is make things relevant. And how do you analyze something to make it better? And so that's what that's why I got interested in history. That's that's what got you into it. Now, are, but but you're you're also a beautiful writer. Um, yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Well, you know, it's a uh, um, writing to me is a is starting to be a little bit of a lost art you know when i really enjoy it um because it's uh it causes you to sharpen your thinking uh you you can get on and talk and talk and talk and the the precision of that and the uh, analytical uh, uh excellence and inter, uh, of that is, is is can be suspect but when you write 
it on paper. It really, you really have to support your facts. You really have to be able to document why you think something. It really sharpens your thinking. Um, I, I, I believe that writing is a, a wonderful way to really understand what happened because you have to go, you know, step by step by step to to under, to, to lay out why something happened. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually a very powerful medium from that perspective. Um, so it is, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, when I first started, I wasn't very good at it, but I got better and better and it's, it's been fun. And I'm, I hope to even get better in the future. Well, your research is phenomenal. Um, so do you have anybody in your life who inspired you, um, to do the work that you're doing to do any, any particular, either, you know, person from, from the past or person in your life who inspired you to get into this work as a writer? As well, a historian? I'll, I'll tell you, what, someone that, that, that helps me and prods me is my, my wife, Mary. She's really good as a, um, as, as a sounding board and advisor. And sometimes she says, you know, that wasn't very good, <laughs> which is great. And that's what you want as, as, as a, as a writer, um, uh, is definitely what is, definitely what you want. Um, you know, I had a roommate in college that was a tremendous scholar, and uh, I learned a lot from him. He's a professor at the University of Colorado, and I learned a lot from, from him. Um, uh, and I had several friends that were, uh, that are, um, had had second careers, and, th and that kind of gave me the, the, uh, the, the beacon, the light to be able to move on to something different. Uh, I, I really think that um, if you keep doing the same old, same old, You'll be the same old, same old. Here, and I here. want to be the young person. Well, here, here. Well, I, well, I'm sure you and Mary are. Well, hats off to Mary uh, <laughs> for being your muse and for being the the power. You know, the person, the power behind the man. So, um, let's talk. Let's talk about your recent book, William Hunter, Finding Free Speech. Um, now, will let me tell my viewers that William Hunter was a British soldier's son who became an early influential American. Now you write in your book that William's life story is a remarkable example of embracing adventure, overcoming challenges and taking prudent risks. He cleaned valuable life lessons from his varied non-traditional background. Now, everyone might not get to grow up on two continents to reside in three national capitals and to learn multiple languages, but William Hunter's experiences in adapting to and thriving in numerous cultures are a potent reminder, and this is from your, you actually wrote this, a potent reminder that these skills are critical to succeeding in the increasingly tight-knit 21st global community. So tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book about William Hunter. And tell us okay, about well, it. I, I, lo I love talking about the origin story of this book uh, because it, it, in a word, it's just serendipity. Um, I, I was invited, my wife and I were invited to a, uh, a dinner party in, in our neighborhood in Washington. Um, and as you know, you go to a dinner party, they never seat you next to your wife, right? So you sit next to someone you don't know, right? And so uh, I sat next to a very nice woman. And, and you know, as, as things go, they, you ask, what do you do? And I said, I was an historian of the American Revolution. And she said, we have a, 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 a diary in our family possession. We don't know much about it, but I think it's about the American Revolution. Would you like to go look at that diary? And boy, I jumped at that chance. And what I found was an unbelievable document. It's a one of a kind. It's written by a child of a British soldier uh, during the American Revolution. It's written in beautiful 18th century handwriting, just gorgeous 18th century handwriting. Um, and it talks about the basically the first 25 years of this, of this boy's life. Uh, but the unique thing about it, Melinda, was there was no name in the diary. And so I had to figure out who was the author. And I had to authenticate the diary because you don't know. I mean, you know, fakes happen all the time. So I, I had to authenticate the diary and find, find out who it was. And so that was really got me started with this book because it was an intriguing, uh, it was an intriguing uh, problem to solve, uh, which I ended up doing. And I ended up establishing that the, that the author was a William Hunter. Um, he, uh, he was actually born in the United States. Um, he was born in uh, New Brunswick. His father, uh, was a member of the 26th Regiment of Foot, uh, a sergeant in that uh, British regiment. Uh, his mother uh, came over with a father in 1768, so before the war. Uh, and uh, he, um, uh, William was born while they were stationed in, as a garrison in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, and uh, so he was here before the war. So in many ways, he was a British subject. 
like most uh, everybody was in the colonies, but he was born American, but his father was fought uh, in the war against the Americans. And so that really intrigued me. Fascinating. Um, now, did William, now William Hunter lived a long 86 years from the War of Independence to the American Civil War. Most people didn't live that long. Um, and, and so tell us a little bit about his long life. Um, and I also want to ask you, have, I'm sure this woman who you spoke to was thrilled that this book came out of that serendipitous dinner party that you had where you were seated next to this woman. I mean, that kind of stuff is really rare and it's so exciting when it happens that way. Tell us a little bit about, a little bit more about William Hunter. Okay, well, I'll, t I'll start with your second question, then I'll, I'll fill in the story of William. Uh, the family was is really excited because I was able to put together genealogy between William Hunter and, and the family today. And the family today is a very large family. Uh, there's, you know, maybe 50 people that have some kind of interest in this family. So it's a very large, you know, it, it's just kind of spread out. So this William Hunter, you know, like it's like every other early colonialist in the United States, the family, you know, grows. And uh, so they're they're very excited, and we uncovered uh, some things about the family that they didn't know. A lot of things they didn't know about the family, and even some of William Hunter's descendant, descendants have um, some unique interests which aren't in the book, but uh, the family really enjoyed. So it was it's been a uh, uh, the family has really been wonderful to work with, and I can't say no good things about that. Um, William Hunter's story is, uh, uh, is, is uh, during the revolution, his father was stationed in Montreal. And, um, and when the Americans invaded Canada, his father uh, uh, was stationed at Fort St. John, just north of the Vermont border. And uh, during that battle, um, uh, Richard Montgomery captured the fort and, and um, William's father, uh, John Hunter, was egregiously wounded just scalded. It's just a horrible wound. Uh, he was near a, a keg of gunpowder. So uh, when all the British soldiers and their families, basically there were 263 women and children with these soldiers. So more, more, more family members than there were soldiers, if you can believe that, went into captivity and they were sent to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. But William's father was too uh, ill to, um, to travel. So they spent the winter in Fort Chambly um, here, the masonry fort that the uh, uh, just a little further north of the Vermont border. Uh, but then, uh, uh, when his father got better, they went to, to Lancaster. His father then fought in several more battles um, uh, because it was exchanged. Uh, they spent a year in captivity, was exchanged, fought in several more battles, and then his father got what they called back then worn out, uh, which means that you you know you, to be a soldier back then you have to be able to march. 30 miles a day and, you know, and carry a 90 pound pack and fight battles and build, uh, build uh, log structures and all that. He just lost that ability. So he was sent back to Britain on a ship and a big convoy. Uh, and then believe it or not, a big storm came up, blew the convoy apart. And as uh, uh, William's ship uh, approached uh, the English Channel, a French privateer captured him. And so they spent another year in a prisoner of war camp in, in uh, La Havre, France, uh, uh, in uh, 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 Brittany. And so uh, then again, his father was exchanged. And then William uh, traveled to, to London. Uh, he, he, then he went to all the, all, several other places where his father was uh, moved around in a recruiting mission to recruit soldiers to come to the United States. Um, and then um, it came time for William to, um, to strike out on his own. And his father wanted him to become a soldier. His mother said, no, no more soldiers. <laughs> this is a heart too harsh of a life. So he became an, a, a, a printer. He apprenticed himself as a printer. And um, back then, England had a real, uh, uh, a lot of uh, disruption between uh, religious uh, factions and um, uh, the French Revolution. Uh, there were a lot of issues with free speech. And so... Um, uh, William became a disciple of uh, or a follower of um, uh, Joseph Priestley, you know, the guy that uh, invented ox or discovered oxygen and did the, you know, club soda. Uh, but uh, and um, when he became oppressed, William says, I want to find free speech. So he moved to the United States. And so it's kind of interesting. He kind of came back to America 
uh, but he was a British soldier, a, a son of a British soldier. And in the United States, uh, USA was an immigrant. Uh, he uh, uh, received a lot of um, uh, uh, of discrimination because of his background. So, uh, which we wouldn't think today of any English person being discriminated in the United States, but he was back then. Of course, yeah, I, I would think so back then that that might happen. So um, I'm talking to Gene Proc now about his new novel, his new book, uh, William Hunter, Finding Free Speech, um, a British soldier's son who became an early American. So Gene, um, there are no paintings or physical descriptions of William Hunter. He was, as you say, an ardent 19th century American in every sense. Can you explain that? Well, you know, and it's um, and I really have to get people's mind to go back into the 19th century and not in our 21st century perspective, um, because he 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 was uh, he fought for free speech. He was an, he was a, a follower, a, a supporter of Thomas Jefferson, um, Andrew Jackson. He helped uh, Andrew Jackson get elected uh, uh, president and uh, served Andrew Jackson uh, presidency. Um, he he was a business person. Uh, he. Uh, built businesses. He went out of business uh, with the various panics and, and, and depressions that happened, recessions that happened back then. Um, but he also had social views which reflect the, the society of that time. Um, he published very, very stridently anti-slavery editorials in his paper, you know, while at the same time employing slave people in his businesses. So he had these conundrums back then. So it's, you know, you, if you look at one part of him and say, boy, this guy was a really an early abolitionist. Then you look at him as being a slave owner. And so, you know, this judgmental thing is hard. You can't really do. You have to put it in the context of their, of their time. It was the people were wrestling with this. And I think he was wrestling with this. How do you deal with this? How do you end this, this horrible institution? But if you're going to operate a business back then, you almost had no choice because your competitor, competitors were slave uh, uh, owners and used slaves. So if you're going to compete, that's the only way you could compete. He he um, operated uh, businesses um, uh, after he got rid of his uh, newspapers uh, to were hemp businesses, which is a god awful, smelly, dirty business. Uh, not like today, <laughs> but it was a horrible business. They made rope and they made bagging that held the cotton in it and um, and employed uh, sometimes up to 50 enslaved people in those in those in those businesses but yet at the same time wrote anti-slavery um, uh, editorials in his paper it's so interesting he also had little regard for Native Americans as well and and that I mean that was seemed to be a common theme with the with it during that time oh, too and it was horrible yeah he moved to Kentucky pretty much after the Indian Wars had just finished within a year or two of the Indian Wars of finishing there um and they really had basically nothing good to say about Native Americans it was it was really uh, it was really kind of a, a genocide it was a genocidal type view here that, that they they wanted to either kill them or push them west and that's what is that what they did and it was really a land grab you know they they uh, you know William Hunter didn't speculate in land but most of his compatriots speculated land they bought and sold land that was the biggest the biggest advertiser in his paper was um uh was was land land sales and land speculators so that's really what funded the newspaper in his um uh, advertisements that's what made him his money so you have a section in your book on chapter 22 where you say where it's why is william hunter's life relevant today so can you share with my viewers why and what would he say about these times in the 21st century global community? And do you see some similarities from that period to our American political scene today? Well, that's a, uh, I appreciate you bringing that up because one of the things that we always think about American history, we call it American history, and it really isn't American history. It is really a global, we're part of a global history. I mean, he, he, he competed uh, uh, his businesses competed uh, with hemp manufacturers all over the world. His newspapers, well, you read those newspapers, there's no local news in those newspapers. It's all international news. These people knew what was going on around the world. It was a global 
community, just like it is today. We're a global community. And they would uh, they'd actually send ships down the Kentucky River to the Ohio River to the to the Mississippi River over to Europe and back that trade route. So it was a global economy, just like it is today. Um, the, the other thing that, that to me that it's important is that um, immigration is hugely important to us today. And this is a story of an immigrant doing well. And, and this is a, sto a story of an immigrant making a, um, uh, making a huge contribution. He was a community leader. He established um, uh, schools for both men and women, which was very unique back then. Um, he, he established uh, uh, dams and buildings and, and uh, roads, and he worked on commissions to do all those kinds of things. So the idea of people investing in their communities is, a, is something in helping our, the communities grow and develop. That's, a, that's something that resonates uh, really well today. Um, and, and I also think the, he was in the newspaper business. And if you think the newspapers are biased today, they were really biased back then. He, was a, he, he supported Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson and Andrew Jackson. And he was against the Federalists like John Quincy Adams um, and um, John Marshall. And you, you cannot be, go down the middle. Just like today, you, you have one on one side, one on the other side. It was even worse, I think, back then. Um, so, so, so William Hunter, you say finding free speech, was that through his, his, um, his newspaper work, his newspaper? Yes. Um, and, and yeah. And, 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 and to me, that's, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Th that's really one of the fascinating parts of his story. Uh, you know, he came to the United States because he didn't think he could get free speech. He was being discriminated against in Britain. He could not say what he wanted to say in Britain. He wanted a republic form of government. Britain had at that time, a constitutional monarchy, um, and um, and so he, he he came to the United States for that, um, and then when he gets here in 1798, just after he he, he uh, uh, emigrates to the United States, uh, John Adams passes the Alien and Sedition Acts, which is probably one of the most egregious um, interferences with free speech we've ever had in the United States. It basically outlawed criticizing the government. I mean, we would put half of our country in jail, we had that law today, um, uh, because it, it was very egregious. Um, and he published, the law was passed and enacted in June 1798. And a couple weeks later, he passed the, he, he wrote the first editorial, which opposed those acts. And that editorial, when he wrote it, he knew he could have been prosecuted under the, under the act for opposing those acts. And in fact, um, Adams's administration Several of the um, people uh, the, um, actually recommended to John Adams that they prosecute Hunter for those for writing that article. And so he was he faced he faced you know think about the courage that it takes. He faced the loss of his paper, the loss of his livelihood, going to jail, and you know, what that would do to his family. The loss um, of his life. His life, and so life. I mean it's just horrible. And he did that courageously. Now, fortunately for him. And this is this is another Vermont connection. Uh, fortunately for him, um, the uh, government decided that they couldn't get a good jury uh, in um, in uh, Kentucky, but th so they prosecuted Ma Matthew Lyons in Vermont, and because they could, thought they could get a jury in Vermont to convict Matthew Lyons, which they did, and uh, Matthew Lyons went to jail uh, for for um, the, under the Alien and Sedition Act, and not William Hunter. Uh, so uh, it's it's it's. It's and then actually Matthew Lyons uh, emigrated from Vermont to Kentucky after he got out of jail. So it's it's, it's really interesting the, the interconnections here. How fascinating to my viewers! I'm speaking with Gene Proc now about his new book, William Hunter, Finding Free Speech, and I'm sure that they can find this in their local uh, Phoenix bookstore or any local bookstore, right, Gene? Well, you have to go to your bookstore to ask for it, but it's on Amazon it's, okay. uh, or through Sunbury Press, the, my publisher, which is a phenomenal publisher, Sunbury Press or Amazon, you can get it. Um, it's okay. a, um, uh, um, it, 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 if you order it today, you'll, you can get it within two days. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an extraordinary book. And I just want to say that the, your bibliography and your appendix, I mean, is like, your, is like 40 pages. I mean, the research you put into this book is phenomenal. So I just want to, want to ask you um, about William Hunter when he was seven years old, that he may have met Ethan Allen 
in Canada after he after Ethan Allen was captured and marched through the streets of Montreal. And I'm wondering what impression that must have made on young William Hunter. Oh yes, uh, yes, there is a, a Ethan Allen connection. Um, you know, the the I've really gone through the I've gone through the uh, his diary in detail, and it's amazingly how accurate it is. And there are, but what I found kind of two embellishments uh, here, um, and uh, this is one of the embellish, which is I think one of the embellishments. Um, Ethan Allen was uh, captured uh, when uh, when he was attempted to uh, uh, assault. Um, um, Montreal, the town of Montreal, before the main American army, he kind of went out there uh, uh, way out in the vanguard for, you know, and it was really risky and ridiculous what he did. So he was captured about five or seven miles outside of the city. So I don't believe a seven-year-old boy would be wandering the woods five to seven miles from the, from the, uh, uh, from the town center all by himself. Uh, and he could see the running battle. It was a running battle. It took place over several miles. So I, I don't really think he saw the battle. But I do believe he, that that Ethan Allen was paraded through the streets like a trophy uh, uh, in the streets of Montreal. And I bet you that uh, he saw Ethan Allen then, because that's why it got in the diary. Um, uh, so I, that's what I, you know, so he, he saw Ethan, um, you know, our... our uh, uh, our most famous Vermonter, I guess, but uh, uh, it's he's uh, he was proud of that. I'm um, sure he was. I'm sure it made a big impression on young William Hunter. Now, as a historian, Gene, can you share with my viewers where you see our democracy in 20 years? Oh boy, that's a tough question. You know, I, I will uh, I will say that as as much as the things uh, change, they say the same. I mean, if I look back on William Hunter's life, um, you know, they had, if I use the word fake news, they had worse fake news than we had, because what they would do is within two weeks of the election, they would print the most outrageous thing about their opponent, because it took two weeks to, to debunk that because of the speed of, of information flow back then. So I, I think that's... I think that we have to continue to invest and grow our democracy, just like they did back then. And I believe that in, back then, they did look for truth and just. I do believe that William Hunter tried to print the truth. I don't believe, I believe he was a supporter of Jefferson. He was not a supporter of Adams. I believe he was very fervent. But I do believe that he he never got sued for libel. That's one of the few, most newspaper editors got sued for libel back then. He never got sued his whole life for, for a libel. Okay. So I think he was searching the truth. And I think that that, to me, I, I think that we can see that today. And so I think as we invest in our democracy and invest in going forward, um, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but I think our problems, if we look back in the past, we see our problems in the past. And I think 20 years from now, to your question, our, our, the next generation will look at our problems today and see some of their problems. And I think that if we invest, those problems will be solvable. They will be more solvable. I mean, like today with the internet, we know how to debunk fake news real easy. You know, it, it gets debunked real real quickly uh, in our business. And I think it'll be even more debunked in the future. Thank you for that, Gene. So what's your next project? Oh, it's fun. I, 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 I'm, uh, I have an edgy one. Um, uh, I, I'm working on a, um, a, a Revolutionary War general by the name of Charles Lee. And everybody today kind of believes he was a scoundrel. Um, he was a ne'er-do-well. He was a, a, a traitor to the United States. And I'm taking the contrary point of view. And that's one of the fun things about um, uh, uh, history is uh, I'm taking a contrary, contrary point of view. And uh, my belief is that his star shone brighter in the first year of the revolution than George Washington. George Washington had a very slow start. Uh, now, where he finished was a tremendous place, obviously, in our history. Um, but uh, during that first year, Charles Lee was a much better general, a much better leader, and probably contributed more to our um, our independence 
than Washington. So it's an edgy, uh, kind of a different story. So it's it's going to be kind of fun. Uh, you know, the traditional thing is that um, uh, Char- they said, uh, John Adams said that Charles Lee uh, liked dogs better than people. And I'm thinking, man, he fits in really well today in our society because everybody loves dogs. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, so I, I think, you know, it, it's it's kind of, uh, he, I think he's been misunderstood. And I, I think there's a different perspective. I'm not going to say he was better than George Washington or he should have been revered as much as George Washington or he had as much impact. I'm just saying that he wasn't the scoundrel and the horrible person that the historians have made him out to be today. Well, I cannot wait to read your next book. And to my viewers, we've had a wonderful half an hour with Gene Prock now talking about his newest book, William Hunter, Finding Free Speech. Uh, Go to your local bookstore, order on Amazon. And um, Gene, thank you so much for your time today and for sharing with my viewers a little bit about your life and about your extraordinary historian career and the books you've written and sharing with us a little bit about William Hunter. What a cool guy. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Melinda. I really appreciate the opportunity. I mean, for folks who who shy away from history, Gene's books are like novels. They're beautifully written. It's beautiful stories. You get captivated and carried away into this time. And um, you're a beautiful writer, Gene. And thank you for this wonderful half hour. And to my viewers, thank you for being with me.